So, you got your reading eyes today? Okay. <laughs> All right. So we're going to read something out of 2 Babylon. Okay, so Acts chapter 12, verse 1, uh, verse 1 through 4. Now about the time Herod, about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church of mm -hmm. the ecclesia. Mm -hmm. And he killed James, the brother of Yachanan, with the sword. And because he saw it, please... Mm -hmm. The Yahudim mm -hmm. who proceeded further to take Peter also, mm -hmm. then were the days of unleavened bread. Mm -hmm. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quarter quarterneums mm -hmm. of soldiers mm -hmm. to keep him intending after say Easter, read it. Easter mm -hmm. to bring him forth to the people. See, brother, see, see. It says Easter. Easter's in there. So Easter is the same thing, brother. Got you. Got you. Got you, Kazak. Right? Right? So that's what they'll say. Oh, we just showed you in Acts chapter 12, verse 4. It says Easter, brother. So Easter is the same thing as Passover. All right? But now, let me say this before. She's going to break it down. My is going to read the definition so we can be on the same page. Right? Now, if you notice, the translator slipped that word Easter in there on you. Intentional, right? All right. But now the word in Greek is what for Easter? Pascha. Uh, you ever go ahead and read it. Go ahead and read, the brother boy says. Of Chaldee origin, mm -hmm. the Passover, the meal, the day, the festival, or the special sacrifice connected with it. All right. Now. Hmm? I'm just going to say they have Easter, comma, Passover. Right. So, Easter, how do you get Easter out of Pesach? It's not a transliteration, right? It's not. If you transliterate Pasha, which is the Greek, does it say from the Hebrew? What's the Hebrew root? What does it say? Oh, so when you pull it up, it, it has in the definition. There you go. H6453. Uh, just hoover over it and it, it, uh, it'll bring it up. It never does that. Not, oh. Not on mine. You got, where your dictionary at? Over here? Oh, you got them over there. Okay, look at it in your dictionary. My Maisha, she got her she got her east sword laid out different than mine. <laughs> okay. But let's do this here. I got my I have my tablet. I'm not going to do too much on the computer because I don't want it to go through any unnecessary changes. Alright, so if we look at the word Easter, it's the word Pasha. P-A-S-C-H-A. -S Pasha, right? And Pasha is defined, it says of, as my issue just read, Chaldean or origin, it says compare 6453, the Passover, the meal, the day of festival, or the special sacrifice connected with it. So that's what it says. The Passover is accompanied with the first day of unleavened bread meal. Right? So they kind of go together. It's like the, the, the Passover lamb goes into the first day of unleavened bread. And in the first day, you have what? Unleavened bread with your meal. That's how it's done, right? So, don't worry about it. <laughs> so, it says, uh, it says compared to 6453. So 6453 is the Hebrew word Pesach. P-E-S-A-C-H. Pesach. And Pesach is, it says, is from 6452. We'll go there in a second. But it says a pre pretermission. Did I say that right? Pretermission? Mm -hmm. That is an exemption. Used only technically 
up. Now they throw their little spin in here. The Jewish Passover is not the Jewish Passover. We just read in Leviticus 23 that it is the Feast of Yah. Well, we understand that the Feast of Yah was celebrated before there was a Israelite nation on the earth. Then we we understand that why it says in Leviticus 23 that these are the Feast of Yah. Why? Because they keep the feast days in heaven. We read that in Jubilees. When you understand that the feast days were kept in heaven before there was a physical man on the earth, then you understand that these feasts are Yah's feasts because Yah is the one that ordained them on the earth so as it is in heaven, right? Mm -hmm. That's why the Messiah said when he prayed, he said, let thy kingdom come and thy will be done in earth, right, as it is in heaven. So, earth is a shadow of the things that are in heaven. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. So, it's nothing new. We're not learning something new. We're not teaching something strange. We're teaching, we're showing you that these things, that's the reason why they threw all these books out, brothers and sisters. That's the reason why they threw out the, the Apocrypha books. Because the Apocrypha books, it, ex it exposes the doctrines of Baal, which is the doctrines of Halel, Lucifer, Satan, the devil, right? Now, going back to the definition, so it says also, it says pretermission, it says from 6452, which is Pesach, which means, listen to this, this is, this is, this is really good. A primitive route to hop. <laughs> that is to skip over or to spare by implication to hesitate also literally to limp to dance right so Israel the word Passover Pesach comes from passing over from what crossing over the river right and that what happened Mm -hmm. It's so it's so it's so the Hebrew language is so it's so uh, definitive. Is that a good word? It's, she's she's my 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 uh, <laughs> she checks me out. I be creating words sometimes. <laughs> Y'all pray for me. <laughs> but um, the the Hebrew scriptures is so definitive, right? It is so active that every word in Hebrew, it's graphic, it's picturistic, right? So when you say Pesach, you're saying basically crossing over, okay? You're talking about the literal crossing over of the children of Israel from Egypt across the Red Sea or Sea of Reeds into the Promised Land, right? It's also significant of Israel crossing over from the way of the pagans. Oh, my mercy. Huh? Crossing over from the way of the pagans into the way of Yah, the creator. Right? Remember the Mosai out of the book of Yahoo 10. He said, learn not the way of the heathens. Now, our, our beloved sister Beverly Beatty said that the, the Africans were idols, idolaters, and pagans. They're not the only people that was idolaters and pagans. We're going to show you that in, 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 in this to Babylon. We're going to read some stuff out of here. This is actually a hard copy, but they left some stuff out of this. I'm going to read something from a digital copy. Uh, which is a PDF of the original book that was written, produced in the 1800s, I think it was. Okay, so they kind of they kind of trying to hide some stuff when they give you the new copy. That's why it's good to get the the ancient original, right? <laughs> All right. So it says so. Pesach to cross over to hop to skip over, right? That's what that word means to cross over. So and incidentally, the word Eber which is where we get the Hebrew word from, 
that means to cross over too. Right? So, you got the word Hebrew, Hebrew, which means to cross over, and then you got the word Pesach, which also means to cross over or to skip over, right? To hop over, right? Okay? So, in definition, brother pastor, the word Easter is a substitution which is a translation intentional uh, deception to cause the religious world to embrace this festivity called Easter, right? Now, with that said, we're going to do some reading. You got your reading eyes. I'm going to let my Isha read. <laughs> and she can stop when she get ready to stop, right? But I want you to start right there where it says, this is uh, on this book, for those of you that, you got to read this part before that too. <laughs> you might like, no, that'll get you off track. This is talking about the mother, but whew, so much in this book, brothers and sisters. But if you want to read it, you can read it. But actually, I want you to start with the child in Assyria. But, but just read that paragraph before that, that might make you want to read something else. <laughs> I'm pass that on. She said she's going to pass that on. That'll, get, that'll take you somewhere else. This will take you somewhere else. <laughs> All right. So this is page um, in the in, in the 18. Two, page 18 in two Babylons. And what I'm going to do is while she's reading, I'm going to try to see if I can find a link so you can actually get an original copy of that. It's got the notes and everything in it. OK, go ahead. One of the names of the Chinese Holy Mother is Ma uh, Supu, mm -hmm. in regard to which, see the note below, mm -hmm. the child of Assyria. Mm -hmm. Okay, now stop. They left the notes out in there. That's why I said you got to get the original copy because they explain all of that, right? There's a, there's a big movement where they're worshiping Mother Earth or they call her, they call her the Mother, God the Mother. Right. And it's taught and, and it said Chinese, but they got notes in there because this mother, she's supposed to be where she, she's a Chinese woman. What was her name? I sung, I sung something. Y'all know y'all. If, if y'all are research, know what I'm talking about. I keep getting the lady's name right. It ain't for me to really know, know her name. That's why I keep getting wrong. But I sung, hung something. All right. And it says the child in Assyria. Uh -huh. The original of that mother so widely worshipped, there is reason to believe was Semiramis, already referred to who it is well known was worshipped by the Babylonians mm -hmm. and other eastern nations, and that under the name of Re, the great goddess mother. Hmm. Oh, so, uh, so you got a lot there. Now, so you got R Rhea. R yeah. Rhea is called the goddess mother. So now picture this now. <sighs> the Catholic Church gave us the Virgin Virgin Mary and the Virgin Child, right? So the Virgin Mary is actually Rhea, which is I'm gonna let her continue to read. She, he's gonna break it down in there. All right. It was from the sun, however that she derived all her glory and her claims to deification. That son, though represented as a child in his mother's arms, was a person of great stature and immense bodily powers, as well as most fascinating manners. In scripture, he is referred to, says C. Ezekiel 8 and 14, mm -hmm. under the name of Tammuz, but he is commonly known among classical writers under the name of Bacchus, that is the lamented one. Okay, stop. Let's do that. So, what was that scripture reference again? Ezekiel eight and fourteen. Okay, I'm gonna read that. Ezekiel eight fourteen. All right. So we're talking about Tammuz, right? And what did it say about Tammuz? Tammuz was what the sun. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you say is it your Keskel? Uh, yes, Ezekiel eight and fourteen. Okay, go ahead. What was you gonna say? Oh, you said Tammuz says he's commonly known under the name of Bacchus. Okay, my bad. I, I, I'm jumping ahead. So, 
momentum okay. one. Eight and fourteen. Fourteen. All right. So this is your Keskel Ezekiel eight fourteen, and it says, um, "Let's read up a little bit." Verse twelve. This is your Keskel Ezekiel chapter eight and verse twelve, right? It says, Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in his chambers of his imaginary, for they say, Yah seeth us not, and Yah have forsaken the earth. He said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of Yah's house, the door of the church. <laughs> and he says, which was towards the north and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Okay. Then said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee again, and you will see greater abominations. And he brought me into the inner court of Yah's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of Yah, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men with their backs towards the temple of Yah, and they faced towards the east. And they worship the sun towards the east. Hmm. Then he said unto me, this is verse 17. Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Yehuda that they commit abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger and lo they put the branch to their nose therefore will I deal in my fury my eyes shall not spare neither will I have pity and though they cry in my ears with a loud voice yet will I not hear them so we see we can see that today People get down and praying when Trump lost the election. They, ah, oh, victory, victory. <laughs> and it goes on. The B goes on, right? All right, go ahead. We're back in the uh, two Babylons. Continue reading in the section where it says the, the child of Assyria. Now, those of you, uh, if you're looking at the message board, I just put a link in there where you can get a copy of that. You can get a copy of the two Babylons for free. Right? You got different variations of how you can get it. You can get a PDF, you can get a text, you can get uh, uh, some other uh, 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 sources that you can view it from. So click on that link and go ahead and save that to your computer and let that be a good study tool for you. Okay? All right, go ahead. To the ordinary reader, the name Bacchus suggests nothing more than revelry and drunkenness, hmm. but it is now well known that amid all the abominations that attended his orgies, their grand design was professedly the purification of souls, hmm. and that from the guilt and defilement of sin. Hmm. This lamented one exhibited and adored as a little child in his mother's arms seems in point of fact to have been the husband of Semiramis, mm -hmm. whose name, Ninus, by which he is commonly known in classical history, mm -hmm. literally signified the sun. Mm. As Sem Semiramis, the wife, was worshipped as Rhea, whose grand distinguishing character was that of the god, great goddess mother, mm -hmm. the conjunction with her of her husband under the name Ninus, mm -hmm. or the sun, mm -hmm. which sufficient to originate the peculiar worship of the mother and son mm -hmm. so extensively diffused among the nations of antiquity and this no doubt is the explanation of the fact which has so much puzzled the inquirers into ancient history 
that Ninus is sometimes called the husband and sometimes the son of Semiramis. Mm. This also accounts for the origin of the very same confusion of relationship between Isis and Osiris, the mother and child of the Egyptians, for as Bunsen shows, Osiris was represented in Egypt as at once the son and husband of his mother and actually bore as one of his titles of dignity and honor the name husband of the mother. Mm -hmm. This still further casts light on the fact already noticed that the Indian deity Iswara is represented as a babe at the breast of his own wife Icy or Parvati. Hmm. So they're basically showing you how this mother son cult is not just exclusive to one nation, but he's showing you that all the other nations are practicing, even in India. Okay? All right, go ahead. Now, this Ninus or son born in the arms of the Babylonian Madonna is so described as very clearly to identify him with Nimrod. Ninus, king of the Assyrians, says Trogus Pompeius, epitomized by Justin, first of all changed the contented moderation of the ancient manners, mm -hmm. incited by a new passion, the desire of conquest. He was the first who carried on war against his neighbors, and he conquered all nations from Assyria to Libya, as they were yet unacquainted with the arts of war. Mm -hmm. This, we keep going. That's good. Okay, okay now, so we, we, we laid the groundwork. Now, she mentioned about a note, right? Uh, when you read that, it said, see, it says, see notes, see note below. But they left the notes out intentionally. So we're going to read the notes. Um, Okay, can you see that there? I got to highlight it. All of the yellow? Oh, just not that one, the one there, but okay. that, the first the paragraph. Start now. Now, assuming that this is the father of the deities by whom Rhea, whose common title is that of the mother of the deities, and who is also identified with G, or the earth goddess, had the child called Muf, or death, who could this mother of gods be but just our mother Eve? And the name Rhea, or the gazer, bestowed on her is wondrously significant. It was as the gazer that the mother of mankind conceived by Satan and brought forth that deadly birth under which the world has hitherto grown. Hmm. It was through her eyes that the fatal connection was first formed between her and the grand adversary under the form of a serpent whose name Nahash or Nakash as is. So there you have E. So now if you go to uh, Genesis chapter three, you will see that they have did the same thing with Easter. I'm showing you the translators took the Mother of all living's name in the Hebrew text was written Kawa. So when the translators translated the text, they took Kawa out and they put Eve in there. Eve is Rhea, right? And he's breaking it down. Eve is Rhea, right? The mother, Eve, Rhea, the gazer, okay, and the wonder, wondrously significant, right? Okay. She is a connection was formed between her and the grand adversary <laughs> under a form of a serpent whose name was Nahash or Nakash, right? So that's it. The original, 
the original of that mother so widely worshipped, there is a reason to believe was Semiramis. All right. He has a note there. Did you read that part, Sir Rawlingson? Mm -mm. I'll read it. Sir Rawlingson have found evidence at Nineveh of the existence of Semiramis about six or seven centuries before the Christian era seems inclined to regard her as the only Semiramis that ever existed. But this is subversive of all history. The fact that there was a Semiramis is a, pr a, pr a, pr a, pr a prime, is that primeval ages of the world is beyond all doubt, although some of the exploits in the, in the later queen have evidently been attributed to her predecessor. Okay. Did you read this part about um, it is from the sun that she derived her glory and her claim as deification? Okay. Or right, read that part right there. Just down to that line. It was okay. This is uh, this is the electronic version. It's not in the book. That's why I'm going back and forth where they left some stuff out of the book. Okay, go ahead. Something. Did you read that? It was worded a little. Was that in the book? I read it somewhere. Okay, you did read it. I see it. Okay, it's here. Okay, good. So we won't read it again. Okay, good. Now, what I want to do, I want to go to um, in the book. This is page seventy-seven, but it's on a different page in the in the electronic. This is this is on the festivals. Okay, I'm talking about this. This is the festivals. So Easter was a festival, right? All right, go ahead. This is chapter three, mm -hmm. festivals. Then look at Easter. What means the term Easter itself? Mm -hmm. It is not a Christian name. It bears its Chaldean origin on its very forehead. Mm -hmm. Easter is nothing else than Astarte, mm -hmm. one of the titles of Beltis, the Queen of Heaven, mm -hmm. whose name, as pronounced by the people Nineveh, was evidently identical with that noun in common use in this country. That name, as found by Layard on the Assyrian monuments, is Ishtar. Mm -hmm. The worship of Bel and Astarte mm -hmm. was very early introduced into Britain along with the Druids, the priests of the groves. Wait a minute. Stop. Who? Priests of the groves. The worship of Bel and Astarte. Right. Read that again. The worship of Bel and Astarte, Astarte was very early introduced into Britain along with the Druids, the priests of the groves. Mm, the priests of the groves. You see that? Is that the asteroid? Hmm? The groves. Mm hmm. Yep. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to find where she is in here because it's. It, it's um, what, where are you at now? Some. Some have. Let me see. I got to find where she is. Hold on. Just bear me one second. This is, this is, uh. Wait for you. It's probably not worded the same anyway. Say, then this look is the beginning at of chapter three. Oh, okay. I see. I'm, I'm, okay. Okay. I see. Oh, this is, this, this has other, this has other stuff that that don't have. <laughs> okay. Then look at East. Okay. I got you. I'm with you now. All right. Where you at now? Some. Some. Have. Uh, wait a minute. Okay, I got it. Some have imagined. Okay, I got it. Okay. Some have imagined that the druidical worship was first. Hold on a second. Those of y'all that downloaded this, now I'm going to kind of help you find where we are. Okay. So this is um. If you downloaded the PDF, this is on page 101. This is on page 101 of the PDF uh, version of the original book. The two Babylons. Okay, so now we're kind of like on page one hundred one, and we're reading um, the section under Easter. Okay, go ahead. Some have imagined that the druidical worship was first introduced by the Phoenicians, who centuries before the Christian era traded to the tin mines of Cornwall, but the unequivocal traces of that worship are found in regions of the British Islands where the Phoenicians 
never penetrated. Mm -hmm. And it has everywhere left the indelible marks of the stronghold which it must have had on the early British mind. Mm -hmm. From Bell, the 1st of May is still called Beltane in the Almanac. And we have customs still lingering at this day among us, which prove how exactly the worship of Bell or Moloch, for both titles belong to the same deity, had been observed even in the northern parts of this island. Mm -hmm. The late Lady Baird of Fern Tower in Perthshire mm -hmm. says a writer in Notes and Queries thoroughly versed in British antiquities mm -hmm. told me that every year at Beltane or the 1st of May a number of men and women assemble at an ancient dru druidical circle of stones on her property near Creef. Mm. They light a fire in the center. Each person puts a bit of oat cake in a shepherd's bonnet. Mm -hmm. They all sit down and draw blindfold a piece from the bonnet. Mm -hmm. One piece has been previously blackened and whoever gets that piece has to jump through the fire in the center of the circle mm -hmm. and pay a forfeit. Mm -hmm. This is in fact a part of the ancient worship of Baal. Mm -hmm. And the person of whom the lot fell was previously burnt as a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Now the passing through the fire represents that. Mm -hmm. And the payment of the forfeit redeems the victim. Mm -hmm. If Baal was thus worshipped in Britain, uh -huh. it will not be difficult to believe that his consort, a consort Astarte was also adored by our ancestors, mm -hmm. and that from Astarte, whose name is Nineveh, was Ishtar, the religious solemn solemnities mm -hmm. of April, mm -hmm. as now practiced, are called by the name of Easter Come on, say amen, somebody. that month. Mm -hmm. Among our pagan ancestors, having been called under the name of Easter in the third or fourth centuries, was quite a different festival from that now observed in the Romish church and at that time, the Romish church, and at that time, was not known by any such name as Easter. It was called Pasch, or pa Passover, Passover, and though not of apostolic institution, was very early observed by many professing Christians in com commemoration of the death and resurrection of the Messiah. Okay, that's good. Now, mm -hmm. I got a note, uh, huh? Huh? <laughs> That's putting it where the ghost can get it, right? <laughs> so let's just kind of recap what she just read, because she read a lot of stuff. Basically telling you that the Druids, the British people, who gave us America? Mm. Huh? Mm -hmm. Hello? Who gave us America? So they gave us their worship of Baal, which they got it. They did get it from the Phoenicians because historically the Phoenicians went all up in the year. They indoctrinated them. They they raped them. So if we read about that in in, um, in the book of um, Africanus, right? They went all up in Europe and was raping. Uh, in uh, Rudolf Windsor's book, he talks about how that the uh, Arabs was raping the European women. We read that in uh, the Reader's Digest uh, the last 10 million years. And we read that in the Reader's Digest uh, Dictionary of the Bible where he talked about the Arabs went and so we know that the Phoenicians took the sea trade routes up into Spain and Europe. So what did they do? The Phoenicians, the Moabites, the Moors, the Canaanites, they're the ones that originated, uh, or I should say coined, <laughs> transitioned all of the worship of Baal Astarte from Babylon. That's what the book is called, The Two Babylons. It all started in Babel. There's another book. It began in Babel. It talks about all that, right? So now, bringing it home, the, the English Druids, are very spiritual type people. They are the ones that that begin practicing the worshiping of Baal, right? And which is uh, a, a a variation because see, 
<laughs> is deeper than what we believe. The worship is basically feminine, feminine and masculine, mm. right? Uh, the the I believe I read somewhere. Don't quote me. Some I can't remember which book it was. It talked about the god that they worshipped was a her her mm -hmm. Lady Columbia, which is the same person as Astarte, Isis, uh, Semiramis, was they, they in the legend. It said that she was a her She was uh, had two genders. So when you say by all, it's not to confuse you. And by all is a reference to a deity that has no gender. Oh my mercy. <laughs> so now we got the Druids practicing that and now the Druids and the British people embracing it. And when they established America, what did they do? They brought all of their worship of their pagan deity into America. And since we was in captivity, what did they do? They threw it on us. So we left out of the land of Canaan where they was doing it, came to America and the same deity that we left from Israel in the land called Canaan follow us right back to the lands of America. Waiting for us. Waiting for us, my sister said. <laughs> and we celebrate, oh, we celebrate in resurrection, Easter. This man is telling you, Easter is not what you think it is, right? All right, now, there's a note here that's not in this book. She's going to keep reading, but I'm going to read a note because they always got notes left out. Now, this is on page 102 now of the PDF for format of this book that I lay gave the link. If you don't have it, go scroll up into the comments, click that link, download this book, read it, share it, teach from it, do whatever, right? All right, so now he says, this, this is under a footnote. It says, Socrates, the ancient ecclesiastical historian. I like that. <laughs> Socrates, the ancient ecclesiastical historian, after a lengthened account of the different ways in which Easter was observed in different countries. In his time, i.e. the 5th century, sums up in these words. Thus, much already laid down may seem a sufficient treatise to prove that the celebration of the Feast of Easter began everywhere more of customs than by any commandment, either of the Messiah or apostles. He says, Everyone knows that the name Easter used in our translation. Hear me, brothers and sisters, and fall out your chair if you need to. Listen. He says, everyone knows that the name Easter used in our translation of Acts 12 and 4. We read it right refers not to any Christian festival, but to the Passover. This is one of the few places in our version where the translators show an undue bias. In other words, they tricked you. <laughs> All right. Let's just say your next paragraph will start with that festival. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, good. She's going to read now. We're still on page 102 in the PDF. And on this book, she's in um, 78. Mm -hmm. Page 78. Okay, go ahead. That festival agreed originally with the time of the Jewish Passover. Oh, throw that Jewish out. The, 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 the Feast of Yah. <laughs> With the feast of Yah, when the Messiah. the Messiah was crucified, a period which in the days of Tertullian mm -hmm. at the end of the second century was believed to have been the 23rd of March. Mm -hmm. That festival was not idolatrous. It was preceded by no Lent. Huh? Wait, what? It was preceded by what? 
No Lent. Where did Lent, where did Lent come from? We're going to deal with that. Hold, hold on to your seats. Go ahead. It ought to be known, said Cassinus, mm -hmm. the monk of the Marseilles, mm -hmm. writing in the 5th century and contrasting the primitive church with the church in his day mm -hmm. that the observance of the 40 days had no existence so long as the perfection of that primitive church remained inviolate. See that? So no, no 40 days of observance. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Whence then came this observance, mm -hmm. the 40 days of abstinence of Lent was directly borrowed from the worshippers of the Babylonian gods. Read that again, please. Mm -hmm. The 40 days abstinence of Lent was directly borrowed from the worshipers of the Babylonian gods. See that? So that's where Lent, brother, family, friends, loved ones, did y'all participate in Lent? Lent came from Babylon. That's what the man just said. Lent came from Babylon. The 40 days of what they call denial. We did it in the church, right? You're going to deny yourself from, from something, right? You don't eat as much sugar or, or don't eat as much uh, fried foods. Or, you know, the church, they, 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 they bit into it. And some of them posted them on Facebook, right? We keep in Lent. They telling you Lent is connected to Babylon. That's what they do down in the Mardi Gras mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in the uh, New Orleans. That's the festivity of the Babylonians. The worship of Astarte, brothers and sisters. What do they call it? Uh, Mardi Tuesday or something like that. Mardi Gras. And then they have the Tuesday they call, what is it? Mar Fat Tuesday. There you go. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Such a Lent of 40 days in the spring of the year is still observed by the Yazidis or pagan devil worshippers uh -oh. of Kurdistan. Read that again. Mm -hmm. Such a Lent of 40 days in the spring of the year is still observed by the Yazidis or pagan devil worshippers of Kurdistan. So that's where your 40 days observed is, is, he says, worship by devil worshippers. Pagan devil. Uh, somebody for this is the Beverly Beatty. She talked about the Africans worship devils. You Christians that keep lit, your practice, this man said, came from the worship of devils. It has nothing to do with Africa, it has everything to do with Christianity. But y'all ain't gonna talk to me. Go ahead. Who have inherited it from their early masters, the Babylonians. Mm -hmm. Such a Lent of 40 days was held in spring by the pagan Mexicans. For thus we read in Humboldt where he gives account of Mexican observances. Mm -hmm. Three days after the vernal equinox began a solemn fast of 40 days in honor of the sun. In honor of the sun, which is going to con... con how do you say it? Uh, um, what's the word we're looking for? culminate, not culminate, but climax, I use that, on the Resurrection Sunday. Y'all ain't going to talk to me. I don't know if you're going to say it in there, but, but that's what it boils down to. All right, go ahead. Such a Lent of 40 days was observed in Egypt, as may be seen on consultant Wilkinson's Egyptians. This Egyptian Lent of 40 days, we are informed by Landseer, and his Sabian or Sabian researchers was held expressly in comm commemoration of Adonis or Osiris, mm -hmm. the great uh, mediatorial deity. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the rape of pros Prosper Proserpine. Proserpine seems to have been commemorated and in a small manner for Julius Vermicus informs us that for 40 nights the wailing of Proserpine mm -hmm. <laughs> continued and from Arnobius we learn uh, that the fast which the pagans observed called Castus or the sacred fast was by the Christians in his time believed to have been primarily an, in imitation of the long fast of Sears. Mm -hmm. Sears. Uh -huh. Sears, which for many days he determinately 
refused to eat on account of her excess of sorrow. Mm -hmm. That is, on account of the loss of her daughter, mm -hmm. daughter Proserpine, mm -hmm. when carried away by Pluto, that the deity of hell. Mm -hmm. As the stories of Bacchus or Adonis pro perceive. Oh, can I get that? Right? So you know we got. Don't they have Pluto T <laughs> Pluto TV? Pl Pl <laughs> <laughs> they 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 believe in holding on to the name of that deity, don't they? Pluto TV. How about that? Did y'all know that? All right. So what's where are we at now? Oh, Proserpine. Proserpine. Uh -huh. Though originally distinct, were made to join on and fit into one another, so that Bacchus was called Liber mm -hmm. and the wife of Ariadne Libera, which was one of the names of Proserpine. It is highly probable that the forty days fast of Lent was made in latter times to have been referenced to both. Mm -hmm. Among the pagans, this Lent seems to have been an indispensable preliminary to the great annual festival in commemoration of the death and resurrection of Tammuz, which was celebrated by alternate weeping and rejoicing, and which in many countries was considerably later than the Christian festival being observed in Palestine and Assyria in June. Therefore, called the month of Tammuz mm -hmm. in Egypt about the middle of May and in Britain sometime in April to conciliate the pagans to nominal Christianity. Mm. Rome, pursuing its usual policy, took measures to get the Christians and pagan festivals amalgamated mm -hmm. mm. and by a complicated but skillful adjustment of the calendar it was found <laughs> no difficult matter um, in general to get paganism and christianity now far sunk into idolatry mm -hmm. and this as in so many other things to shake hands the instrument in accomplishing this amalgamation was the abbot dionysus mm -hmm. the little mm -hmm. to whom also we owe it as modern chron Chronologers have mm -hmm. demonstrated that the date of the Christian era or the birth of the Messiah himself was moved four years from the true time. Whether this was done through ignorance or design may be matter of question. But there seems to be no doubt in the fact that the birth of the Messiah was made full four years later than the truth. This change of the calendar in regard to Easter was attended with momentous consequences mm -hmm. it brought into the church the grossest corruption and the rankest superstition in connection with the abstinence of lent let anyone only read the atrocities that were commemorated during the sacred fast or pagan lent mm -hmm. as described by arnabius and clemens alex alex drinus alexandrian and surely he must blush for the Christianity of mm -hmm. those who, with the full knowledge of all these abominations, went down to Egypt mm -hmm. for help to stir up the languid devotion of the de degenerate church. And who could find no more excellent way to revive it than by borrowing from so polluted a source mm -hmm. the absurdities and abominations connected with which the early Christian writers had held up to scorn mm -hmm. the Christians should ever think of introducing the pagan abstinence of Lent was a sign of evil mm -hmm. it showed how low they had sunk and it was also a cause of evil it inevitably led to deeper degradation mm -hmm. originally even in Rome Lent with the preceding revelries of the carnival was entirely unknown and even when fasting before the Christian uh, Pesach was held to be necessary it was by slow steps that in this respect it came to conform with the ritual of paganism what may have been the period of fasting in the Roman church before sitting in, in of the Nicene Council does not very clearly appear but for a considerable period after that council we have distinct evidence that it did not exceed three weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. 
What? <laughs> she just read her mouth full. Now, I got a footnote here. Uh, the, the, the next paragraph, does it say Geisler? Mm -mm, okay. The words of okay. The words of Socrates is the next paragraph. Wait a minute, hold on. I read that, didn't I? Hold on. Maybe, maybe they flipped it around on us. Does it say Socrates, an ancient ecclesiastical historian? Mm -mm. Okay, all right. I'm going to read this one then. This, this is uh, another footnote. Geisler, speaking of the Eastern Church in the second century in regard to the Paschal observance, says, In its Paschal festival, in commemoration of the death of the Messiah, they, the Eastern Christians, eat unleavened bread, probably like the, the Hebrews, they say Jews here, eight days throughout. There is no trace of a yearly festival of resurrection. <laughs> Do you hear that? There is no trace of a yearly festival of resurrection. So where did the resurrection Sunday come from? It, so the people say, we celebrate the resurrection Sunday. This is something new they threw on y'all. So Eastern, i read again. The, it says, there is no trace of a yearly festival of a resurrection among them. For this was kept every Sunday, Catholic Church. In regard to the Western Church, at, at a somewhat later period, the age of Constantine, 15 days seems to have been observed to religious exercises in connection with the Christian Paschal Feast, as appears from the following extracts from Bingham, kindly furnished to me by a friend, although the period of fasting is not stated. Bingham origin says, the solemnities of Pasch are the week before and the week after Easter Sunday, one week of the cross and the other of resurrection. The ancients speak of the passions and resurrection passed as a 15 days solemnity. 15 days was enforced by the law of the empire and commanded to the universal church. Skagliger mentions the law of Constantine. That's who your Lord is, Constantine. Or two weeks for Easter and a vacation for all legal processes. Don't we see that today? They have Holy Week or the 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 um spring break all of that is all tied to this fest festival of Estarte of Easter and now so you said the words of Socrates right okay go ahead the words of Socrates writing on this very subject about AD 40, 450 are these those who inhabit the princely city of Rome fast together for Easter 3 weeks Accepting the Saturday and what they call here the Lord's Day. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, 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 oh. They, they put the Lord's Day in it, but they call Saturday. They didn't say Sunday. Huh? So they, they know. Touch your neighbor say they know. All right, go ahead. But at last, when the worship of Astarte was rising into the ascendant steps, were taken to get the whole... Let me but at the last, but at last, when the worship of Astarte was rising into the ascend, ascendant, steps were taken to get the whole Chaldean Lent of six weeks or 40 days made imperative on all within the Roman Empire of the West. Mm -hmm. The way was prepared for this by a council held in Aurelia in the times of Hormus, Horm, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> Bishop of Rome, about the year 519, which decreed that Lent should be solemnly kept before Easter. Mm -hmm. It was with the view, no doubt, of carrying out this decree that the calendar was a few days after readjusted by Dionysus. Mm -hmm. This decree could not be carried out all at once. About the end of the 6th century, mm -hmm. the first decisive attempt was made to enforce the observance of the new calendar. Mm -hmm. It was in Britain that the first attempt was made in this way, and here the attempt met with vigorous resistance. 
the difference in point of time betwixt the Christian Pesach after as observed in Britain by the native Christians and the pagan Easter enforced by Rome at the time of its enforcement was a whole month and it was only by violence and bloodshed at last that the festival of the Anglo-Saxon or Chaldean goddess came to supersede that which had been held in honor of Messiah. Good. Oh man, huh? <laughs> huh? <laughs> he, he telling us that the pagan festivity of the Anglos, that's the Anglos, I'm going to break it down just so you can get it. Anglo is English. Okay, English is a transliteration of Anglo. Right? So the English Saxons, they're the ones, Britons, uh, England, right? They be the ones that gave us this, right? He says the Anglo, the festival of the Anglo-Saxons, which they borrowed from the Chaldean deity, came to supersede that which had been held in honor of the Mashiach. So the early followers did participate in the Passover, but when the pagan uh, authorities, the Roman Catholic Church, you got to get this book called uh, The History of the Christian Church. You can Google that and get a PDF of that. He breaks down all of the paganism that the Roman Empire brought into the, the Roman Catholicism and that therefore caused a split. Right? It eventually led to the movement of called the the pro the Protestant the protest. Martin Luther and people before Martin Luther was another man called I think John Husk, right? They all protested against the Roman Catholicism because they said the Roman Catholicism was had become a, a apostate church or pagan pagan invasion, right? All right, so let's see. Mm -hmm. Hmm? So even here, they can see how their beloved Easter was forced by violence and bloodshed. We getting all dressed up and putting our bonnets on. That's that's an excellent point. Mm. So they forced they forced the inhabitants of the empire to embrace this folly. You comply or die. That's basically what it was, right? Mm -hmm. The next paragraph does it say? Communists quoted by Archbishop. Mm -mm. Okay, this is another, I'll read this. this. is another note. Okay, Cuminus, this is on page of the PDF. This is now page 104. If you're following us along in the PDF, this is page 104. Uh, Shabbat Shalom to uh, Sheila. Uh, blessed Shabbat and Pesach. Hallelujah. Okay, so. Cominus quoted by Archbishop Usher. Uh oh, Archbishop Usher. Siloge. Those who have been brought up in the observance of Christmas and Easter and who yet abhor from their hearts all papal and pagan idolatry alike may perhaps feel as if there were something untoward in the revelations given above in regarding to the origin of these festivals. But a moment's reflection will suffice entirely to banish such a feeling. They will see that if the account I have given be true, it is of no use to ignore it. A few of the facts stated in these pages are already known to infidels. And so uh, Sakonian writers of no mean mark both in this country and in and on the continent and these are using them in such a way as to undermine the faith of the young and uninformed in regard to the very vitals of the he says the Christian faith right surely then it must be of the last consequences that the truth should be set forth in its own native light. Even though it may somewhat run counter and preconceive opinions, especially when that truth justly considers tend so much at once to strengthen the rising 
youth against the seductions of popery and to confirm them in the faith once delivered to the saints. There you go. If a heathen could say, Socrates, I love and Plato, I love, but I love truth more. Surely a truly Christian mind will not display less uh, magnanimity. Is there not much even in aspect of the times that ought to prompt the earnest inquiry? If the occasion has not arisen, when efforts and strenuous efforts should be made to purge out the national establishment in the South, in the South, those observances and everything else that has flowed it upon it from Babylon's golden cup. There are men of noble minds in the in the church of Craner, Latimer and Ridley who love his words, the Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity, who have felt the power of his blood and known the comfort of his spirit. Let him in their closets and on their knees ask the question at their deity and at their own consciousness if they ought not to bestir themselves in right earnest and labor with all their might till such consummation be effected. Then indeed would England's church be the grand bulwark of the Reformation. Then would her son speak with her enemies in the gate. Then would she appear in the face of all Christendom, clear as the sun, fair as the moon, terrible as an army with banners. If, however, nothing effectually shall be done to say the plague that is spreading in her, the result must be disastrous, not only to herself, but to the whole empire. So those are the words of this bishop in Rome, Cuminius, whoever his name is. Okay. All right. Now, do you have such is the history? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Such is the history of Easter, the popular observances that still attend the period of its celebration imply confirmed testimony of history as to its Babylonian character. Uh oh, watch out. Listen, listen. Go ahead. The hot cross buns of Good Friday and uh, the dyed eggs of Pesach oh my mercy. or Easter Sunday figured in the Chaldeans' rites just as they do now. Uh oh. The buns known to by that identical name were used in the worship of the Queen of Heaven and the goddess Easter. As early as the days of Cecrops, the founder of Athens, that is, 1500 years before the Christian era. One species of sacred bread, says Bryant, which used to be offered to the deities was of great antiquity and called bound or bun. Hmm. Diogenes Laertius, speaking of this offering made, being made by Empedocles, describes the chief ingredients of which it was composed of. He offered one of the sacred cakes called bun, mm -hmm. which was made of fine flour and honey. The prophet Yermiyahu takes notice of this kind of offering when he says, the children gather wood, the fathers kindle fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven. Look at that. <laughs> Wait a minute, <laughs> stop. <laughs> the Easter egg, you know, and and brothers and sisters, we have some dear beloved Christian friends that are going to participate in the Easter egg hunt. Guarantee you. But he says right here, Easter eggs. Um, he's going to explain the Easter egg. But, okay, go ahead, continue read. You, you, you got Jeremiah 7, 18? Yeah. What's the next paragraph? What does it say? The hot post buns. Okay, so, okay, let me read this here. Okay, this is this is not in your... Okay, so this, it says here, Yermiyahu 7, 18. It is from the very word here used by the prophet that the word bun seems to be derived. The Hebrew word with the points was pronounced kavan which in Greek became sometimes kaponos or, or photius lexicon 
and at other times Kabon, Neander, Kittos, Biblical uh, Cyclopedia, I guess that's the reference. The, the first shows how Kavan pronounced as one syllable would pass into Latin as panis, pania, pania bread, pania bread, right? Mm -hmm. Panis bread, they had that pania bread, uh, panera bread, that's where it came from. And, and the second how, in like manner, Kavan became bond or buns. It is not to be overlooked that our common English word loa has passed through a similar process of formation in Anglo-Saxon. It was halaf. Okay, so basically, they was baking cakes. The prophet Yirmiyahu was talking about them baking cakes to the Queen of Heaven. That's uh, Yirmiyahu seven and eighteen. So let's see, Yirmiyahu uh, Yir or Jeremiah seven and eighteen. I think is what he's talking about. Okay. Are y'all learning anything? Okay, this is 7 and 18. I know you don't feel a goosebump going down your spine. You don't feel the Holy Ghost. <laughs> That's a brother boy. You don't feel the Holy Ghost. <laughs> That's the problem. We got feelings and we have no knowledge, right? Um, the, children, the children gather wood, fathers kindle fire, and the women knead their doughs, and they make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto other deities that they may provoke me to anger. So basically, what is it saying? Remember doing the, that, that is a practice of the pancake day, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is, that, is that on that Tuesday, right? That, I think it is. that Lordy, Marty, Lordy Tuesday before is the day before they do the Lent. They had a pancake day. They call it pancake day. Everybody does it. They don't know why, but they say it's pancake day. They don't know why or where it came from, but that's where it came from. It came from them baking cakes to the Queen of Heaven. Oh my mercy! Huh? Right. They have it. They have it uh, as they are. It's pre Lent. Oh, okay. Okay. Gotcha. It leads up to the forty days, the Lent season, mm -hmm. right? You eat this cough with, is, it must be the Fat Tuesday, right? It's the <laughs> Fat Tuesday where you eat the pancake. They call it Fat Tuesday, right? Okay. Yeah. All right, go ahead. The hot cross buns are not now offered, but eaten on the festival of Astarte. But this leaves no doubt as to whence they have been derived. Mm -hmm. The origin of the, the Pesach eggs it's just as clear. The ancient Druids bore an egg mm -hmm. and the sacred emblem of their border. In the Dionysica or Mysteries of Bacchus as celebrated in Athens, one part of the nocturnal ceremony consisted in the consecration of an egg. The Hindu fables celebrate their mundane egg as a golden color. The people of Japan make their sacred egg to have been brazen. Mm -hmm. In China, at this hour, dyed or painted eggs are used on sacred festivals, even as in this country. In ancient times, eggs were used in the religious rites of the Egyptians and the Greeks and were hung up for mystic purposes in their temples. Mm. From Egypt, these sacred eggs can be distinctly traced to the banks of the Euphrates. Mm. The classic poets are full of the fable of the mystic egg of the Babylonians, mm -hmm. and thus its tale is told by Hyginus, mm -hmm. the Egyptian, the learned keeper of the Palatine Library at Rome. Mm -hmm. In the time of Augustus, who was skilled in all the wisdom of his native country, an egg of wondrous size is said to have fallen from heaven mm -hmm. into the river Euphrates. Mm -hmm. The fishes rolled it to the bank where the doves, having settled upon it and hatched it, out came Venus, who afterwards was called the Syrian goddess, that is Astarte. Hence the egg became one of the symbols of Astarte or Easter, and accordingly in Cyprus, one of the chosen seats of the worship of Venus or Astarte, the egg of wondrous size was represented on a grand scale. Mm, okay, stop for a second. 
So I have an image to see because she don't have it on there. But they got an image here. Let me see if I can see. And you can see it. It's on. Oh. Wait a minute, hold on. <laughs> Y'all see that? So that's that's the egg. That's the egg. It says here a sacred egg of Heliopolis and Typhon's egg from Bryant's mythology. The sacred egg of Heliopolis. Okay. And here's the mystic egg. Does you do you have the cultic meaning? Okay, good. See that? Can y'all see that? Okay, go ahead. The occult meaning of this mystic egg of Astarte is one of its aspects, for it had a twofold significance, had reference to the ark during the time of the flood, in which the whole human race was shut up as the chick is enclosed in the egg before it is hatched. It it any if any be inclined to ask, how could it ever enter the minds of men to employ such an extraordinary symbol for such a purpose? Hmm. The answer is, first, the sacred egg of paganism is already indicated, is well known as the mundane egg. That is the egg in which the world was shut up. Mm -hmm. Now, the world has two distinct meanings. It means either the material earth or the inhabitants of the earth. The latter meaning of the term is seen is in Genesis 11 and 1. Mm -hmm. The whole earth was of one language and of one speech, mm -hmm. where the meaning is that the whole people of the world were so. If then the world is seen shut up in an egg and floating in the waters, it may not be difficult to believe. However, the idea of the egg may have come that the egg thus floating on the wide universal sea might be Noah's family that contained the whole world in its bosom. Then the application of the word egg to the ark comes thus. The Hebrew name for an egg is baits, or in the feminine, mm -hmm. for there are both genders, baitza. Mm -hmm. This in Chaldee and Phoenician becomes baith or baitha which in these languages is also the usual way in which the name of a house is pronounced. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Keep going. Okay, where's, where's the next line, sir? The egg floating. Okay, here's a little, little footnote. The common word Beth house in the Bible with dot points is by as may as may be seen in the name Bethel as given in Genesis 35 and 1 and the Greek Septuagint where it is Based L. Okay, go ahead. The egg floating on the waters that contained the world was the house floating on the waters <coughs> of the deluge with the elements of the new world in its bosom. The coming of the egg from heaven evidently refers to the preparation of the ark by express appointment of Yah. And the same thing seems clearly implied in the Egyptian story of the mundane egg which was said to have come out of the mouth of the great deity. The doves resting on the egg need no explanation. This then was the meaning of the mystic egg in one aspect. As however everything that was good or beneficial to mankind was represented in the Chaldean mysteries as in some way connected to the Babylonian goddess. Hmm. So the greatest blessing to the human race which the ark contained in its bosom was held to be Astarte, who was the great civilizer and the benefactor of the world. Mm -hmm. Though the defiled queen whom Astarte represented had no actual existence till some centuries after the flood, yet through the doctrine of uh, Metaphys metaphysicists, which was firmly established in Babylon, mm. Hmm. It was easy for her worshippers to be made to believe that mm -hmm. in a previous incarnation she had lived in the antediluvian world and passed in safety through the waters of the flood. Mm. Now the Romish church adopted this mystic egg of Astarte and consecrated it as a symbol of Christ's resurrection. Mm, talk to me. 
a form of prayer was even appointed to be used in connection with it. Mm -hmm. Pope Paul V, or Pope Paul V, mm -hmm. teaching his superstitious votaries thus to pray at Easter, bless, O Yah, we beseech thee that this thy creature of eggs, that is, may become a wholesome sustenance unto thy servants, eating it in remembrance of Yahshua the Messiah. Scottish Guardian, April 1844. Besides the mystic egg, there was also another emblem of Easter, the goddess queen of Babylon, mm -hmm. and that was the ribbon or pomegranate. Mm -hmm. With the ribbon or pomegranate in her hand, she is frequently represented in ancient metals mm -hmm. and the house of Rimen, in which the king Damascus, the master of Naaman, the Syrian worship, uh -huh. was in all likelihood a temple of Astarte, mm -hmm. mm. where the goddess which with the Rimen was publicly adored. The pomegranate is a fruit that is full of seeds. And on that account, it has been supposed that it was employed as an emblem of that vessel in which the germs of the new creation were preserved, wherewith the world was to be sown anew with man and with beast, mm. when the desolation of the deluge had passed away. But upon more certain inquiry, it turns out that ribbon or pomegranate had reference to an entirely different thing, mm -hmm. a starte or Sybil was called was called also Idea Meta, the sacred mountain Phrygia, mm -hmm. most famed for the celebration of her mysteries, was named Mount Ida. That is in Chaldee, the sacred language of these mysteries, the Mount of Knowledge. Idea Meta then signifies. Mm -hmm. The mother of knowledge. Mm -hmm. In other words, our mother Eve mm -hmm. first coveted the knowledge of good and evil mm -hmm. and actually purchased it mm -hmm. also dire a price to herself and to all her children. Astarte, as can be abundantly shown, was worshipped not only as an incarnation of the spirit of Yah, but also the mother of mankind. Mm -hmm. When, therefore, the mother of the gods or deities and the mother of knowledge was represented with the fruit of the pomegranate in her extended hand, inviting those who ascended the sacred mount to initiation in her mysteries, can there be a doubt what the fruit was intended to signify? Hmm. Evidently, it must accord with her assumed character. It must be the fruit of the tree of knowledge and the fruit of that very tree was whose mortal taste Mm -hmm. Brought death into the world and all our woe. Wow. I'll stop here. Is that the end? I mean, it goes on and on. Oh, it's more. It's, it, it, gets, it gets gooder and gooder. But now, let me say, because they got a footnote here that's not there, a whole lot of notes that's not in the book. All right? So, Sybil. Sybil was. See, you're going to develop a taste in your mouth to stop calling the mother of all living Eve because now that you know Eve is associated with Astarte. So we got many Hebrews that don't know that. So the Most High is bringing it out in this lesson that this, that this woman that this whole festivity of Easter is about is actually the same woman that they substituted in Genesis chapter 3 with the name Eve. Okay? So we got Eve is Astarte. So when you see Adam and his wife, we know now she was not Eve. Eve is a substitution, brothers and sisters. We got to get that on our belt. Eve is a substitution. And when we learn that, we'll be a whole, whole lot better off. But some people don't want to let it go. They can, even after this lesson, they're going to still con continue to call her Eve. <laughs> 
Now I'm gonna read some stuff because I'm gonna uh, try to try to come to a close because this is the preparation for Passover uh, for the unleavened bread, and so many of you are going to get in that kitchen, get that lamb together, get ready for the feast. Uh, if you're not doing it now. <laughs> um, so this this is kind of like sort of kind of like almost a double Shabbat. And somebody would say, brother, we're not supposed to supposed to um, kindle the fire. But when you have a prep preparatory feast that happens to fall on the weekly Shabbat, that is the exception, right? So how can you, how how in other words, how else can you prepare the, the first day of unleavened bread meal if the preparation day falls on the weekly spot? Okay. So we're gonna try to try to bring this to a close. Okay, now I'm gonna read some footnotes here. This is some good stuff. Okay, this is a footnote that's not in the book. Um, wait a minute, where I begin? Hold on a second. Okay, so this says the meaning of the name Astarte. This is uh, this is a note 10. That Semiramis under the name of Astarte was worshipped not only as an incarnation of the spirit of, I'll read just the way they got it here, spirit of God, but as the mother of mankind. We have clearly, very clearly and satisfactory evidence. There is no doubt that the Syrian goddess was Astarte, Layards, Nineveh, and its remains. Now the Assyrian goddess or Astarte is identified with Semiramis by uh, Athenagoras Legatio and by Lucian de De Syria. These testimonies in regards to Astarte or the Syrian goddess being in one aspect, Semiramis are quite decisive. The name Astarte as applied to her has reference to her as being Rhea or a Sibyl. The tower, she was the tower burying goddess, the first as Ovid says, opera. <laughs> that made towers in cities for we find from Layard that in Syrian temple of Heliopolis, she, Dia Syria, or Asarte, was represented standing on a lion crowned with towers. Now, no name could more exactly picture forth the character of Semiramis as the queen of Babylon than the name of Astarte. For that just means the woman that made towers is, it is admitted on all hands that the last syllable tart comes from the Hebrew word uh, TR. It has been always taken for granted, however, that TR signifies only to go round. But we have evidence that in nouns derived from it, it also uh, signifies, wait a minute, uh, wait a minute. Uh, I lost my place. It, it, let me go back. It has been always taken for granted, however, that TR signifies only to go around. But we have evidence that in nouns derived from it also signifies to be round, to surround, or to encompass. In the masculine, we find tor used for a border or row of jewels round the head and it says see Parkhurst and also uh, Jesenius 
and in the feminine as given in Hiskias lexicon. <laughs> we find the meaning much more decisive brought out. Turis is just the Greek form of turit. The final T according to the genus of Greek language being converted to S. Okay, so there's a lot of grammatical stuff there I ain't gonna deal with. Let me see, let's go down here. The woman that made the encompassing wall, considering how commonly the glory of the achievement as regards Babylon was given to Semiramis, not only by Ovid, but by Justin, Dionysus, Afer, and others, both the name and the mural crown on her head of that goddess were surely very appropriate. Okay, all right. So it's a lot of stuff in here. <laughs> Let me see. This part, this paragraph says, Semiramis being defi defined as a star tape, came to be raised to the highest honors and her change in a dove. There goes your dove. Her change into a dove. That's the, the symbol of the Holy Ghost, right? The dove. <laughs> it's all pagan. <laughs> um, into a dove as she, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in the Greek mythology, which one of those deities was that? Cronus was it Cronus or was it Zeus? It's one of them Greek mythologies where one of them Greek deities turned into a dove, mm. or was it? Or was it Zeus? Zeus took on the images of a lot of things, and so to captivate his, to captivate. Zeus, in order for Zeus to captivate or to win people over, he took on the form of things that people admired, which is kind of yeah, okay. right. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Which I can't is remember who it was. Which is yeah. kind of synonymous with with what Christianity has become, right? That's why they're able to to uh, win a lot of people into Christianity because the Christians allow them to bring in their forms of of pagan worship. And Christianize it, make it okay. All right, so I need my C and I glasses. This <laughs> the color's starting to. Uh, let's see, where was that? Semiramis being defied as a star tech came to be raised to the highest honors and her change into a dove as as being and I read something that I read something that I didn't see. Semiramis being defined as a star tech became to be raised to the highest honors and her change into a dove as has been already shown was evidently intended when the distinction of sex had been blasphemously attributed to the Godhead to identify her under the name of mother of the gods with the divine spirit without those agencies. No one can be born of a child of God and, and whose emblem in the symbolic language of scripture was the dove, <laughs> was the dove as that of the Messiah was the lamb. Since the spirit of Yah is the source of all wisdom naturally, as well as spiritually arts and inventions and and skill of every kind being attributed to him. He gives scripture reference Exodus 31, 3, 35, and 31. So the mother of the, 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 the gods in whom that spirit was feigned to be in, incarnate was celebrated as the originator of some of the useful arts of sciences. Hence, also, the character attributed to the, the Grecian Minerva, whose name was Athena, as we have seen reads to conclude, is only a synonym for Beltis, the well-known name of this Syrian goddess Athena Minerva of Athens, is universally known as the goddess of wisdom, right? Sophia is another one, right? An inventress of arts and science. The name of Starte signifies also the maker of inventions. 
of investigations rather. And in the respect was applicable to civil and ceramics as symbolized by the dove. <laughs> you can't get around the dove. <laughs> That this is one of the meanings of the name Astarte may be seen from comparing it with the cognate names Asteri and Astrea in Greek Astrea, which are formed by taking the last member of the compound word in the masculine instead of feminine. Terry, tree, Terry or, or tree, tree, trinity, right? The later being pronounced tray being the same in sense of tart. Now, Aser Terry was the wife of Persus, the Assyrian Herodotus, and who was the founder of the mysteries of Bryant. As Aser Terry was further represented as a daughter of Baal, this implies a position similar to that of Semiramis. Astri again was the goddess of justice, and you see that little uh, Judge Judy. Don't she have a little symbol? <laughs> now all these symbols start to make sense when you read this stuff. Now, right? Okay. As Astria or Themis was Fatidica uh, Themis, Themis the prophetic. This also was another characteristic of the spirit. For once can any true oracle or prophetic inspiration come but from the inspiring spirit of GLD. Thus, lastly, what can more exactly agree with the divine statement of Genesis in regard to the spirit that the statement of Ovid that Astrea was the last of the celestials who remained on earth and that her forsaking it was the signal for the downpouring of the deluge, destroying deluge. The announcements of the coming flood as the scriptures usher in with these words. Yah said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, <laughs> for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years, and all 120 years of spirit was striving when they came to a, a mother of knowledge as represented with the fruit of the palm grenade. I think you read that part there. Yeah, okay, all right, cool. Oh no, it's another, it's another segment here. Whew, my eyes is... See, this writing is smaller than the other, the other portion of the book. I need a need little... I need my seeing eyeglasses. All right, let me see. Can you see that? Where it says in the spirit strove no longer, forsook the earth and left the world to its fate. But through the spirit of Yah forsook the earth, it did not forsake the family of righteous Noah. It entered with the matriarch into the ark, and when that patriarch came forth from his long imprisonment, it came forth along with him. Thus the pagans had a historical foundation for their myth of the dove resting on the symbol of the ark in the Babylonian waters. And the Syrian goddess or Astarte, the same as Astrea, coming forth from it. Hmm. Semiramis then as Astarte worshipped as a dove was regarded as the incarnation of the spirit of Yah. Hmm. As Baal, the Elohim of heaven, Mm -hmm. had his visible emblem, the sun. So she is Beltis, queen of heaven, must have hers also, the moon, which in another sense was Astarte, the maker of revolutions. For there is no doubt that Tart very commonly signifies going round, but forth the whole system must be dovetailed together. As the mother of the gods was equally the mother of mankind, Semiramis or Astarte must have also be identified with Eve and the name Rhea, which according to the Paschal Chronicle was given to her, sufficiently proves her identification with Eve mm. as applied to the common mother of the human race. Mm -hmm. 
The name Astarte is singularly appropriate for it as she was Idea Meta, mm -hmm. the mother of knowledge. Mm -hmm. The question is, how did she become, how did she come by that knowledge? To this the answer can only be by the fatal investigations she made. It was a tremendous experiment she made when in opposition to the divine command and in spite of the threatened penalty she ventured to search into the forbidden knowledge which her maker in his goodness had kept from her. Thus she took the lead in that unhappy course of which the scripture speaks, Yah made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. Hmm. Uh, Ecclesiasticus 17 and 29. Now Semiramis, deified as the dove, hmm. was Astarte in the most gracious, gracious and benignant form. Mm -hmm. Lucius and Peleus calls her the goddess benign benignant and merciful to me, bringing them to a good and happy life. In reference to this benignity of her character, both the titles Aphrodite, Aphrodite and Melita, Melita are evidently attributed to her. Mm. The first I have elsewhere explained as the wrath subduer and the second is in exact accordance with it, Milita, or as it is in Greek, Melita, signifies the me mediatrix, the Hebrew millets, which in Chaldee becomes millet, is evidently used in Job 33 and 22, I'm sorry, 33 and 23 in the sense of a mediator. The messenger, the interpreter, Malitz, who is gracious to a man and saith, Deliver from going down to the pit, I have found a ransom, being really the messenger, the mediator. Parkhurst takes the word the word in this sense and derives it from Miltz to be sweet. Now the feminine of Melitz or Melitza, from which comes Melissa, a bee, the sweetener or producer of sweetness, and Melissa, a common name of the priestess of Sybil, and as may be, in, and as we may infer to Sybil as Astarte or Queen of Heaven herself, for after for for mm. fiery mm -hmm. has stated that the ancients called the priestess of the. Demeter, mm -hmm. Melissa. He adds also that they also call the moon Melissa. Okay, where do you want me to stop at? That's good. It's, it's on and on. That's good. It's, 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 it's putting the nail in the coffin. Basically, when you when you sum it all up, this is basically telling you Easter. Easter has nothing, absolutely nothing, to do with. The resurrection, the death, burial, or resurrection of the Messiah at all. Right now, this one little section here, this is on page 111. Um, this is the last piece I'm going to read, then we're going to go to the scriptures and we're going to close out. All right, so on page 111, let's see if I can do this here. I'm going to try to bring this on the screen. second here there we go all right okay this is on page 111 it says as Rome cherishes the same feelings as paganism did now when we say Rome you got to remember you're talking about the Roman Catholic when you say Christian basically we the world, when you say Christian, you're not talking about the believers of the Messiah. Okay, we got some Hebrews that like to call themselves Christians. We're not talking about, we don't use the terminology, but some Israelites do use that. But when you say Christian, you're basically talking about the universal church mm -hmm. and the doctrine that comes as a result of that. So when you say Rome, Rome is the ones that gave you Roman Catholicism or Christianity. So now, 
you're looking at this paragraph, it says, as Rome cherishes the same feelings as paganism did, so it has adopted also the very same symbols so far as it has the opportunity. In this country, and most of the countries of Europe, no pomegranates grow. And yet even here, the superstitions of Ramon must as far as possible be kept up. Instead of pomegranates, therefore the orange is employed. And so the, the Papists of Scotland join oranges with their eggs at Easter. And so also the Bishop Gillis of Erden went through the vainglorious ceremony of washing the feet of 12 rage Irish men a few years ago at Easter to conclude by presenting each of them with two eggs and an orange. <laughs> you say foolishness. So what's the moral of the story, brother? There's a whole lot more to the story in this book. We're not going to read the rest of it. I recommend that you get the book downloaded, free copy. If you feel like get the hard copy, my it's just got. But Easter is not the same as Passover. Prayerfully, if you didn't get anything out of what what I shared, you 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 get that. Let's read this part right here. Uh, I read that part there. Mm, let's see, what did I, I saw something I wanted to read. Let's look at this here. Okay, right here it says, no, no, on the contrary, it was the serpent, the symbol. Let's go up a little bit. Where it says here, now let the reader mark well. Now let the reader mark well, according to the classic pagan story, there is no serpent in the garden of delight in the islands of the blessed to tempt mankind to violate their duty to their great benefactor by eating of a sacred tree, which he had reserved as a test of their allegiance. allegiance right. No, on the contrary, it was a serpent, the symbol of the devil, the principle of evil, the enemy of man that prohibited them from eating the, the, the precious fruit that st strictly watched it, uh, that would not allow it to be touched. Hercules, one, one form of the pagan messiah, not the primitive, but the greasy in Hercules, Pitying man's unhappy state, slew or subdued the serpent, the envious being that grudged mankind the use of that which was so necessary to make them at once per perfectly happy and wise and bestowed upon them what otherwise would have been hopelessly beyond their reach. Here then, Elohim and the devil are exactly made to change places. Okay, he's got Jehovah who prohibited man from eating of the tree of knowledge is symbolized by the serpent and held up as an ingenious and malignant being. While he who emancipated man from Yah's yoke gave him of the fruit that, no, that sound like to me, of the forbidden tree. In other words, Satan under the name of Hercules is celebrated as good and gracious deliverer of humankind what a mystery of iniquity is here. Now all this is wrapped up in one uh, sacred orange of Easter. So what is that saying? The whole story behind this is grace. So the law is the taskmaster. <laughs> it's cruel. We don't have to keep those laws. So this um, signifies the the Messiah coming to 
the pagan world signifies you not under the law no more. That's what it boils down to. All right, now let's let's close this out. Um, let's go back to Leviticus Leviticus uh, twenty three. All right, Leviticus twenty three. I think I got it. I got it up and running now. Let's recap. Leviticus twenty three four says, "These are the feasts of Yah, even Kodesh convocations." Let's put the uh, let's do the, let's do the names version in here. Ah, I like that better. These are the feasts of Yah, even the Kodesh convocation. I get that word now. Which you shall proclaim in their seasons. In the 14th day of the first month at even is Yah's Passover. And on the 15th day of the month um, of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto Yah. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. In the first day you shall have a convocation. You shall do no serve out work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire to Yah seven days and seven days is and in the seventh day is a codex convocation. You shall do no serve out work. Now, somebody said, Well, brother, you Hebrews don't sacrifice. Where's your sacrifice at? Next time somebody say something like that to you. Now I want you to do slap them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Don't slap them. It make you want to slap them because that is basically a statement of rebellion. Well, you can't keep all laws. You shouldn't keep. You can't keep all the laws. You're guilty of the whole law. That's another dumb statement. Because it's like saying, well, uh, I can't afford insurance on my car, so I'm not going to get a driver's license. Mm -hmm. Not all food is good, so I'm not going to eat nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's just stupidity. Uh, now, let's go here. Let's close it out with this here, all right? Let's go to the Maury Josiah is probably on this right here. So I'm trying to do a little different because most Hebrews on the Shabbat, we kind of tend to have the same lesson. So I kind of try to be abstract from a lot of, if you want. Okay, so we'll read a little bit of this, but I'm not going to do the majority of the reading. So let's go to Exodus chapter 12, right? And let's go to Exodus chapter 12. This is the this is this is the simplicity of it, okay? Let's bring my let's bring my um, scriptures on the screen. Y'all spoke to Moshe and Aharon in the land of, of Mizraim, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So we know that we hear somebody cutting grass already, right? <laughs> we know it's the new year. Now, unlike January 1st, when nobody out there cutting no grass, right? Wasn't nobody doing no spring cleaning, right? Wasn't no nice weather, right? You couldn't be out in no shorts. I had shorts on yesterday, shorts and t-shirt. You're not gonna be out in January 1st with no shorts and t-shirt on unless you're crazy or drunk a lot of liquor. <laughs> so he says what? This shall be the first month of the year. Speak 
unto the congregation of Israel, verse 3, saying, The tenth day of this month shall they take unto them a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Now, let me stop for a second.